Okay, hi again. Now let's continue looking through groups of, um, uh, of microfossils and let's continue by looking at the calcareous microfossils. So these microfossils are those which make their hard parts from calcium carbonate in different forms. It's going to be one of the longer videos because there are several forms of calcareous microfossil and we're going to meet over the course of this video the calcareous nanoplankton, the uh, foraminifera, ostracods, and I'll be introducing all of those in a bit more depth. And then uh, I'm not going to be introducing, but I just wanted to highlight that there were other examples of this kind of microfossil, the pteropods. So these are some free swimming pelagic sea snails and sea slugs, the culpionilids. These are an extinct group of single celled eukaryotes of currently uncertain affinities and the calcareous algae, so algae that use um, calcium carbonate to make some of their hard parts. I'm not going to men be mentioning them any further, but they all do exist, so just as a heads up. Let's start by meeting the calcareous nanoplankton. So calcareous nanoplankton are very small plankton that are calcareous in nature. I think you probably got that one from the name right. So uh, nanofossils, um, so these are nanofossils which are formed of calcite. So uh, generally they make the, their hard parts, these organisms, of low magnesium calcite. These are known as nanoplankton because they're really quite small. They're generally less than 30 microns across and they're usually somewhere between 5 and 10 microns in terms of um, their diameter, in terms of an individual coccolith. What that actually means we'll meet shortly when we talk about the, um, the morphology of this group. In order to prepare these, you don't need any nasty chemicals to study them. So they're relatively easy to use in many industrial settings or many research settings as well when you're on the move. All you need really is to um, scrape some off the rock uh, to create a small powder, add some water, smear that onto a slide, let it dry, put on a color slip, and then look at it using a light microscope. If you need to, you can use a centrifuge to help concentrate the fossils and ultrasonic to remove clay particles from them. To observe them, as I said, you use normal light microscopes. You can use uh, either cross-polarized or phase contrast um, settings on normal microscopes, or you can use the scanning electron microscope, as has been used to create these images here. So these are examples that show just some of the variation in different forms of these single cell organisms. These are exclusively planktonic marine organisms. So they live in the seas and they generally float in the, I say generally, they exclusively float in the water column. They are unicellular. So they, uh, each organism is just made of one cell and they are a form of phytoplankton. So this means that they are a eukaryote. So they're up here on our tree. They um, are autotrophic. This means that they make their own energy um, and they do so by photosynthesis. They have chloroplasts, but some of them are also heterotrophic. So some of them also uh, consume other things for their energy. This group has been around since the late Triassic and is still around to today, but there was a major extinction in the group where it took a hit at the end of the um, Cretaceous period. Uh, so they are one of the, nevertheless, despite having taken a hit at this time, they're one of the major forms of phytoplankton that is around today. And they've got a widespread distribution in modern seas throughout the photic zone. Wherever there's light, you tend to find these organisms. In, so that they're found in almost all marine habitats. They will generally, when they die, sink to the sea floor, but they're not preserved in really deep waters because um, some sediments go below uh, a point called the calcite compensation, or carbonate, sorry, I should say, compensation depth, um, at which um, calcium carbonate is no longer stable, so um, they will actually dissolve below that depth. So they're not found in deep water sediment. By the far the most common and abundant members of this group are the coccolithophores. These are single-celled algae, um, which are actually haptophyte algae. So they are somewhere around E, on this tree here. Oh, so just above actually, yes, they're the chrysophytes, so just up here on our tree of life. So I'm gonna focus on coccolithophores for, for the last slide. So coccolithophores are calcareous nanoplankton belonging to a, a particular division called the haptophyta. And you can see some examples here. 
just because it's good to be clear about our terms. I, I will highlight here that a coccolith is the microscopic calcareous plates or discs often oval and commonly intricately patterned and ornamented that occur, occur as part of the protective covering of a group of unicellular algae called the coccolithophorids or coccolithophores. So coccolithophores is a name for the um, organism as a whole. You can see a whole series of coccolithophores here. Coccoliths are the names for the individual plates which these things excrete. Um, the those plates are arranged into a spherical layer around the uh, cell, and that sphere is called the coccosphere. So it's um, a, a sphere that's made of coccoliths. And that is basically the coccolithophore's external skeleton. Okay, so lots of words with coccolith in it, but hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so coccoliths are the plates, coccolithophores are the animals, and the coccolith coccoliths form the coccosphere. Well, I said that a lot, didn't I? Anyway, let's let's move onwards. These coccoliths are formed within the cell. They fuse to the cell wall on its inside, and then they are exocytose. They're, they're basically expelled from the cell wall and attached to the outside. There, they are held together by an organic coating to form that coccosphere. So, upon death, individual coccoliths typically become separated and fall to the ocean floor. Um, you can get whole coccospheres preserved, but it's not that common. So for example, all of the chalk in the southeast of the UK, like the cliffs of Dover, all of those are made up of coccoliths, um, which are the decayed remnants of these animals. The actual function of the coccoliths is not particularly, is not well known. It may be um, kind of a, a, an adaptation towards protection. So the coccoliths, could protect the cells from physical damage, bacteria, predators, or pH changes. It could be that these are something to do with flotation and buoyancy. It may be that adding or subtracting coccoliths may keep the organism in, a, in the position it wants to be in the water column. Alternatively, coccoliths could be something to do with light regulation. They may reflect sunlight to protect the cell when the organism is high in the water column, or refract sunlight into the cell if the organism is lower in the water column. Or it could be something to do with the biochemistry of the animals. I say animals, these aren't animals. These are single-celled organisms. The biochemistry of the organisms. Their cells secrete calcite, possibly as a metabolic byproduct. We just don't know. And that's kind of frustrating, but I think it's really interesting. So there you go. So that is the calcareous nanoplankton. I want to introduce you next to a very important group of um, microfossils called the foraminifera. So the foraminifera are single-celled organisms, most of which typically produce a test or a shell. So that test or shell um, is typically one with multiple chambers, and the test often survives into the fossil record as a microfossil. Now, I say that in a fairly sweeping statement. However, I should highlight that that test can be formed in two ways. It can be formed via agglutination. This is when the single-celled organism takes fragments of extraneous material and binds them together using a variety of cements. This may, um, in these cases, the test may be debris that's silice siliciclastic or calcareous in composition, for example and those are arguably less common as fossils than those which use calcareous um, materials or use calcium carbonate to form their test. So in those individuals, uh, you see randomly orientated crystals of high magnesium calcite um, forming the test. These organisms as a whole may be motile. Many of them have things called pseudopodia, which help them, um, help them move. Um, they range in size from between 0.05 to 0.5 millimeters, but some of them can occasionally reach up to 20 millimeters. So we're talking on the chunkier side of our microfossils um, with these organisms. The preparation techniques used to study them depend on the rock type in which they're found. So these uh, preparation techniques include creating thin sections if they're found in very hard rocks and studying them through there. In loosely consolidated sediments, um, 
generally we would um, fragment the sediment sample, then wash and sieve it repeatedly, or if required, we could place it in hydrogen peroxide and simmer it to break down the rock and then sieve into fractions. Because they're fairly big, they can normally be observed using a traditional petrological type of microscope for thin sections or binoculars, a uh, binocular microscope for prepared samples. And generally fossils are picked out with a fine brush mounted in card slides divided into numbered squares with sliding glass covers. They, there are a range of different forms of these shown here and you can see that actually their tests become really quite complex for a single celled organism and they can look like anything from individual mini ammonites as you can see here they're nothing to do with ammonites that's just what they look like i thought it was a, a useful parallel but maybe not maybe i'm wrong so you fairly commonly a series of chambered bulbous kind of bits of shell as you can see in this example there and that one there or sometimes big flat round things so yes, they come in a wide variety of different forms. So this um, group of organisms, these are actually protozoans. This means that they're a class or phylum, depending on which taxonomy you use, of amoeboid protists. So they're the amoeba are here on our tree. Um, and so once more, we're looking at a group of unicellular eukaryotes. Um, and they are a true grouping of organisms. They're a clade in evolutionary terms. They are the most abundant fossils in a wide variety of Phanerozoic sedimentary rocks, which makes them quite important, and they've been around from the Lower Cambrian through to today. Within the group, as I've already mentioned, there are a large range of different forms, and in terms of their um, identification, the chamber arrangement and the aperture shape, so the aperture is the opening to the chamber, are key to their identification. There are a large variety of different shapes, as shown on the uh, diagram on the left here and those different shapes are all linked to different forms of development without the group so how they grow from a, a small to a larger individual as they get older um, defines the arrangement of their their chambers the majority of foraminifera are benthic i.e they live on the on or in the sediment uh, this diagram on the right hand side here shows how a, a range of different species are linked to different depths of sediment. And this makes them very, very useful. So they can tell us the, the depth that a sediment was deposited in. These individuals are found in marshes, brackish water environments, carbonate platforms, reefs, back reefs, continental shelf, and open marine. So there's a wide range of different environments that we find them in. The earliest forms of foram are thought to have been benthic. Most benthic forms are fairly geographically restricted. But as well as being benthic, there are a few planktonic forms of, um, of foram. So typically we associate these with, um, with more recent rocks. The earliest planktonic form is from the mid Jurassic. Um, and these organisms, the planktic benthic, uh, forams are found in tropical, warm subtropical, cool subtropical, subpolar and polar waters, so a wide range of different temperatures. There was a rapid diversification amongst the planktonic forms during the Cretaceous, um, and we have the highest diversity of planktonic forms of foram today in tropical equatorial regions and in areas where water is upwelling. Forams are used in a wide range of different contexts, but they are invaluable for paleoenvironmental reconstructions and for paleo-oceanographical and paleoclimatological purposes. So if we're looking at past geographies or past climates, um, they are a key piece of um, evidence, as well as providing evidence of the environment of deposition of a rock. And this works because each species is really quite particular about where uh, they live. So one example that's shown in this image here is how three different groups of forams and their relative abundances can be used to tell between a range of different environments and water depth. The three end member species are shown in these diagrams here, as explained by that um, triangle on the corner here, and black represents concentrations between those three. In terms of the paleo environment, some of these only live in um, clean, fresh water, whereas others will only live in turbid waters near the mouth of rivers. So that can really narrow down uh, precisely the, the, the 
kind of um, the nature of the water column at the point w where those organisms were living. And they've been used historically quite strongly in the oil industry to identify specific paleo environments for oil exploration. But they are used in research more generally for all kinds of paleobathymetry and paleo temperature study. So forearms are a really important uh, group of microfossil organisms. And let's finish by talking about ostracods. So ostracods are small animals and they have a calcareous carapace or shell. So these animals are um, mostly around a millimetre in size, but can range from about 100 microns in size, that's about one tenth of a millimetre, up to 10 millimetres in size. Most of these are benthic, either swimming, crawling or burrowing at the sediment water interface. Um, but there are rare planktonic forms that actually swim in the water column. They're commonly prepared the same way as foraminifera, with careful washing and um, sometimes with the assistance of um, soaking in hydrogen peroxide and or washing soda before sieving into fractions and picking them with a paintbrush to, to organise them. And they're generally studied with a binocular microscope. You can see some examples of um, an ostracod on this slide here and you can see the, the typical um, kind of kidney bean um, shaped shell um, that you see from the side of these organisms and you can see that it um, is connected on a dorsal surface and has a gape on the ventral surface there. So that's what ostracods typically look like. As I've already mentioned, these little dudes are animals. So we're up here on our tree, and that means that we can actually go into our, the animal tree of life that we've been using in our previous lectures. And I can tell you that these creatures are actually crustaceans. They're crustacean arthropods. They are bilaterally symmetrical um, organisms with a through gut um, that are found here on our tree of life, the arthropods, a member of our clade, the ecdysozoa, that we've already met in this course. Ostracods are actually amongst the more common fossil arthropods um, because, as with other, other members of this clade, the ecdysozoa, they periodically molt their exoskeleton as they grow. Um, that means that there, there are, there's lots of opportunity to, um, to preserve the molt as well as the carcasses of these animals. The carapace initially forms as a, a, a structure, as a, sorry, of a material called chitin, that's an organic polymer, and then it becomes calcified. They've been alive from the Cambrian through to today. The earliest forms were generally marine, and we see freshwater forms evolving around the time of the Carboniferous period. In terms of their geographic range, they are found all of the way from the equator to the poles and they're abundant and widespread in the majority of aquatic environments. So they're a really successful group of animals. If we just lop off one half of the shell and then do a uh, look at that with a scanning electron microscope, this is what we see. And actually we've got really quite a complex organism between those kidney shaped bean shaped shells. We've got a body that is suspended from the carapace via muscles. We've got seven pairs of appendages, you can see some of those here. Um, uh, three around the mouth, those are the ones here, and four behind. And these appendages have specializations. For example, they have sensory organs. Some of them are used to capture and process food. Some of them are used for locomotion, and some of them are used for general cleaning and housekeeping within the carapace. That carapace, as I've mentioned, is hinged along the, the um, dorsal margin that you can see up at the top here in this um, SEM image. And the animal has a digestive system, genitals, nervous system, a median eye, and a pair of lateral eyes. Um, so we're talking about, uh, again, a, a proper bilaterally symmetrical animal, and all of the things you would associate with that. I say proper. It's not like non-animals are not proper at all. That was a poor choice of words. These animals reproduce both sexually and asexually, um, and sexual dimorphism is relatively common in the group. The boys don't always look like the girls. The, the boys generally, um, if in sexually dimorphic species, will have a greater length to height ratio than the females, and females will have a brood pouch carrying eggs. So that's very interesting, that's very cool. So I wanted to finish talking about ostracods by just highlighting why they're useful to us. So the ecology of ostracods is often reflected in the shape and the structure of their carapace. This makes them really useful as paleoenvironmental indicators. To kind of draw them into like three or four main 
broad categories, we find that freshwater ostracods, and there are a couple of these shown on the top left here, are generally creatures which have a smooth, thin, and weakly calcified carapace that looks like a, 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 a kind of a bean in terms of its shape. In pelagic ostracods, we find thin, smooth shells, but often those will have um, uh, long and powerful swimming appendages or antennae sticking out of the gape at the bottom. In contrast to those, benthic ostracods, which are often detritivores or filter feeders uh, and typically burrow into the substrate, will have smooth but small and relatively robust, sometimes elongated carapaces. Compared to those, epifaunal uh, ostracods, that's those that live on the sediment water interface itself, are typically flattened um, on at least their ventral surface, and sometimes they have all kinds of ornamentation, such as is shown on the bottom left-hand side images here in terms of their carapace. So the, the kind of that gives the carapace strength. And that's particularly true of individuals that are known to kind of live on coarser substrates in higher energy environments, which will often have these robust and heavily ribbed carapaces. So when you dig down to know more about ostracods, such as in the example that's shown on the right hand side here, which is a, a description or a, sorry, a depiction of the distribution of different ostracod species through differing salinities in a single bay, you can um, use them to study subtle differences in environments. And this is one fine example of that. So it takes a bit of expertise, but that makes them actually really very useful as fossils. So that's it from me for calcareous microfossils. I'll see you in the next video very shortly.